I'd like to call you, uh, welcome you all to the Region 12 Board of Education. <coughs> it's November 4, 2013. Welcome to November. I know that, uh, well, I'll start. Uh, take attendance. Susan, would you do that, please? Yes. Valerie Anderson. I am here. Tony Bedini. No. Alan Brown. Is on his way. Is on his way. Call his name in a moment. Uh, Gregory Cava. Here. Michelle Gora. Could be late. Her daughter's playing in a state tournament soccer game today for Chicago. So she's on her way back. <coughs> Emily Hibbert. Here. James Hirschfeld. Kelly Lott. Here. Jennifer Pody. Yes. Michael Sinatra. Here. I am here. Peter Tagley. Here. And Alan Brown. Here. Alright, so we're only missing Michelle right now. Alright, thank you all for coming. Uh, next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Minutes, field trip reports. Anyone want to remove the consent agenda from the agenda? Seeing no one, then the consent agenda is approved. Report of the chair. I have no report other than to note that the state uh, tournament uh, games are going on now. And girls soccer and field hockey both play today, but I don't know how we get it. The girls won. That's girls. all for field hockey. Uh, yeah, field hockey. That's it. I was here at 2 o'clock. Yes. All right, great. All right, Dr. Castillo, Superintendent's report. Yes, hi everyone, good evening. Um, Debbie just gave you two handouts. One is a revised October 1st, um, you had gotten the October 1st numbers, it was off by one. Um, one student was counted, so this number is one less, but that student has come back, <clears throat> so the number is oh, one yeah. more, but as of October 1st, <laughs> This is correct, and that's the number that goes to the state. Okay, so just wanted to give you that information. Um, you also got just a handout that uh, Cave is doing some workshops for Board of Education members on December 10th. If you're interested, it's certainly um, worthwhile. For any, and I'm sorry, Doctor. For any board member, new or uh, yes. veteran. I just want to say that for any member who has not been through this, use this as an opportunity to try to do so. Everybody should go through this, I think, at least once. So if you haven't done so, try to do so. Great. Um, okay, 4.1, you have here copies of the exit surveys that I got, that we received, excuse me, from staff and from a um, couple of families. Um, so you can read them. If you have any questions, certainly can do that. Um, Happy to answer anything. If, how many people did you ask and how many actually replied? We sent to every family that had children discharged except for high school. And we sent to all staff members who um, left for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't, we got, from the staff we got a, a, a decent percentage. From the families we did not. Why not high school? Well, when they graduate, I mean. Oh, okay. When they, when eight, you know, 12th grade. Everyone except 12th grade. So, you know, they're interesting. This is just a very small smattering. It's a small spat smattering, but the staff gives you a lot of good information, I think. I think you'll find that they enjoyed working here. They enjoyed the staff. They enjoyed um, the small feel, the professionalism of the staff. Um, there was talk about um, equity in the schools, talk about um, the consolidation of students and services. I think that a lot of people were for that. Is there all in a packet? Can we have one? Well, I have certainly can give you mine if you don't have them. There you go. You can have them all. Okay. Uh, Debbie will give me back. Okay. Yeah, no, so anyway, that's there. I'm happy to answer questions. It is interesting that some of the underlying reasons yeah. tend to be lack of students. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, what you know, a lot of people are worried that you know they may lose their job, um, which is you know something to consider. Mm -hmm. A couple of people, a couple of teachers left to get administrative <coughs> positions, and they were looking for those or full time. Or full -time. You know, as I said, when you hire people for 0.6 and 0.8, it 
those people look for jobs. They're, they're not really, um, um, you know, yes, it's hard to live on point six. That's a good way to put it. So that is, that is very difficult um, in this situation. So that's why we're trying to really look at the staff. How can we use them more efficiently and effectively? And I think with the change in the schedule at the high school, middle school, we were able to do that and get people um, more full time and less people point something because now they're able to teach at both um, schools. Excuse me, are you saying that people that you cannot obtain people to work point six? Well, you can, good? you can, uh, but but they if they have. Um, the option of point six or a full-time position, they're going to take the full-time position. Mm -hmm. So they may be working at you point six, but they're always <coughs> looking for that full-time position. Mm -hmm. My question always, are point sixes always available? No, absolutely oh. not. Okay. And especially in some of the areas um, that are uh, DSAPs, which are um, for the state, oh, why can't I remember, DSAP? Durational yeah. shortage yeah. area. Durational shortage yeah. area, science, uh, math, world language, very hard to find some of those teachers in those areas, especially in the high school. So, um, you know, it, it's difficult. It is difficult. If there's somebody good and they are able to work full time, they are gobbled up immediately. Okay. So. Are these the only extra service we had from family? It's the only two. We only had two. Okay. We Both. sent it to everyone. Yeah, both do know that they'd like more academic <coughs> rigor and challenge. Yes, absolutely. And that's one of the things, um, Kelly came, I thank her to the uh, gifted meeting where we did gifted strategies in the Common Core. It was the first of many parent workshop meetings. Um, but, you know, I do hear that, and especially when I first started here, that they felt that we didn't address the needs of um, the high-end learner as much as we should and so that's one of my goals to do that bring in guest speakers virtual high school uh, help the teachers to develop strategies and differentiation um, so we are working on that that brings me back to what I said at our first meeting about all of the people we have who live in these three towns who are very, well, Valerie Anderson's husband yes. is an example of a best-selling author, yet we don't involve them yes. in anywhere in the school system. Well, we're, we're working on that, yeah. but, I mean, but... I'm not, I'm not and, pushing it, but I'm just yes. saying... No, we're working that. on that, it's, yeah. and the other thing is we do involve a lot of people in the senior project, but you know what? We, we can involve them a lot sooner and a lot more often and at different levels. So we are working on that. Yeah, I'm trying to be... I'm trying to get a list from all the towns. I call the town halls. Yes. It's a list. I mean, people may think it's an invasion of privacy if we call them, but still, with all the talent in these three towns. Absolutely. I'm trying to get the names of all of these authors and musicians. Sure. And talented government officials and whatnot. I think it would be a, uh, an elite concept for yeah. school. I have to tell you, the staff at the high school especially does a lot for the kids. Mm -hmm. Um, extracurricular wise for those who are interested. Um, Wendy Youngblood just took a group on Saturday to Barnard to hear TED Talks um, um, and you know 12 students and one of our students as a matter of fact spoke on um, what was the topic? I don't recall but it'll be in my <coughs> newsletter this week. Um, so she does things like that. We have the Model UN where they get involved with some uh, political um, uh, people who are in the know. Um, they brought in different authors to work with some of the classes. So we do it. We probably don't do it um, um, as um, well publicized as we should and as um, organized and systematic as we should. So we're working on that. Okay. Anything else? Kelly? Yeah, I also note that this is granted a very small sample size of two but neither of these families um, checked off concerns about educational facilities as a reason for leaving the district. And that is um, my experience of people I've, I've known to leave. Concerns about academic rigor is usually right there. And I have heard other stories of people who were on the honor roll taking solid geometry, biology, having to repeat when they leave, or testing poorly, as this, um, this survey notes. I think we need to address um, not just the given <coughs> level of education mm -hmm. here, but make sure that the general level of education for 
our general population, which are most of our students, is up to where it should be. Um, that's a very good point. Um, one of the reasons that we didn't open the parent portal right away in um, Power School is because the teachers really have to work together to understand what exactly a grade means in their classes across the board so that they're based on standards and not based on work completion or effort. Um, so that's really very important as they calibrate so that a grade in this English teacher's class, which is a B, is the same as a grade in this English teacher's class as a B because they're grading to the standards. Um, and that's been something that's a change in thought and process here. And we are working on it, you know, during those PLCs, during curriculum writing, looking at assessments to make sure that everybody's on the same page. But it's very easy to say, it's very hard for some people to do. So we're working on that. That's, that's really important. Grading is very important. Not grading, but rigor. Both. 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 So, okay, um, I'm just going to talk about strategic profile, then we'll go to Ali. The strategic profile is um, in here. The state, in infinite wisdom, is two years behind. So this is from 2011, uh, 12, um, and I guess one of the things to really note is we are down 90 students in two years. Okay, so that's a significant number, I felt. Um, and the other thing I just want to mention, uh, we had originally planned to do Chromebook uh, lessons for tonight, but some people forgot them, and we just felt that maybe we better to just do a Chromebook workshop as opposed to at the end of the meeting where people have to run. So we're going to reschedule that in the next two weeks, okay, and hope that people will come and, okay? So that we're going to take off the schedule. Uh, <coughs> I don't know if you have to make a motion or whatever, but when we get to that. Okay. Um, and so now we have... Can I just make a point yes. about when you talk about the strategic school profile, I just want to highlight yet again that when it talks about the efforts to reduce racial, ethnic, and economic isolation, which is a big deal here, and mm -hmm. indeed is one of the comments made by a parent who took their child to a private school, ASAP is the main provider of on some of these diversity programs. And so I'm glad that we're still supporting ASAP and hope we continue. And it's worthwhile reading page two to see kind of what they do. Mm -hmm. I don't know without ASAP what we have to do here to, to have a diversity program. You're right. I attended um, last month a wonderful all day conference on teaching the diversity in New Britain. And it was free. It was an excellent program. Uh, the auditorium at um, Central Connecticut State College was full of educators, and I would highly recommend that our, our teachers and maybe administrators attend next year. It was very worthwhile. So just to get another perspective on the great multi ethnic. You can remind me when you get the, okay, so this way sometimes, you know, we get so much that we, it gets past us. Okay, uh, Ali O'Harris here to do a um, overview of the pupil personnel services from her department. Um, so she has Thanks. a presentation and then she'll be happy to answer questions. So, Ali, thank you for coming. Standing at the podium? Uh, you can stand there. Is this okay? You're good. All right. Okay. Um, Hi, Ali. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's been a little while since we last talked about I always special like department. Your reports. <clears throat> um, okay, so I was asked to uh, get a presentation together. The last time we spoke, it was February 2012 about the department in general. We've had other conversations, um, but uh, put together um, uh, just a presentation so you know who, my de who the department is, uh, what we do, um, and how things are going. So. Under the Pupil Personnel um, <coughs> Services Department, we have special education teachers and paraprofessionals. We have our guidance counselors, our school psychologists, speech and language pathologists, our nurses are part of our department, occupational therapists and a certified uh, occupational therapy assistant, and we have a physical therapist. Um, within our buildings, I sort of broke down so you know um, who, where my teachers are. 
Uh, our preschool has two teachers and two paras. Uh, between the elementary schools, we have four teachers and 10 paraprofessionals. Our middle high school, uh, I have 7.5 teachers and 11 paraprofessionals. And I'll talk a little bit later about our responsibilities within the region uh, for our private schools, but I have a .4 teacher that goes out and does some service work, uh, service, uh, services in those uh, buildings. Our related services staff. Uh, we have two and a half school psychologists. Uh, we have one and a half here at the middle high, uh, and we have one that goes to all three elementaries, which is new, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, uh, that our one elementary person goes to all three. So we used to have a, a different breakdown, but this has made uh, some standardization of what's happening in each of the elementaries, uh, which is really nice. We have two speech and language pathologists. The way we broke up um, who goes where is one goes to Booth and Washington, uh, and one does the middle high school and Burnham, based on needs of students. We have four guidance counselors at our middle high school. Uh, three counselors uh, spend one half day at one elementary school. Uh, each week. Four nurses, we have one in each building. Uh, we have one occupational therapist and certified occupational therapist assistant, assistant that travels. Uh, they, they travel throughout the district and they work uh, in all buildings and one physical therapist that works in all buildings. Can I just add that um, the counselors from the high school spend time in the elementary school to make up for the loss of the social worker in the elementary schools. Yep. Okay. So, so they're they have teaching, a contact. Right, so they're teaching the second steps um, that our social worker was doing uh, last year, as well as some individual, uh, individual counseling, uh, as well as uh, a, a different um, program to uh, some of the other, uh, a second step program and then a respect, steps to respects program. <coughs> so each of the principals has delineated what uh, they would like their counselor to come in to, to their building and do. Sorry, that sure. physical therapist, do they also work with the sports teams or is that just no. your program? Okay. No, the physical therapist, um, there is a trainer, but that's some, separate from my, my group. Uh, so what I did was I, I made lists of what our, teach, what our, what our people do, just so we're, we're clear. Uh, certainly not an exhaustive list of all the things that they do in their day to day, but for the most part, these are their main roles. Uh, special ed teachers are creating lessons to, um, to uh, implement in classrooms, in general education classrooms with co-teachers to implement outside in a self-contained environment, to work in small groups, to, to do individualized programming for certain students. Um, they're working on IEPs, which are their students' individual education plans. So they work to create, um, they look at student strengths and weaknesses, they create a plan, and then they implement the plan for the student. They conduct evaluations, academic and achievement evaluations for our students, and also reevaluations. So every three years, our students that are identified in special education are reassessed. So those teachers are also responsible for um, the assessments. They're they have to communicate and collaborate with all uh, a variety of stakeholders, parents, uh, outside <coughs> providers, inside providers, uh, um, sometimes work sites that were where we have our students. So there's, a, there's an awful lot of communication and collaboration. Outside providers, uh, adult service agencies where our students will be going next. Uh, our students at the high school, our uh, special ed teachers, deliver transition services. So we focus on what's going to be happening after high school. We make sure that they're prepared for that. Vocationally, post-secondary ed, and uh, living skills, independent living skills. Uh, they work as consultants um, to teams. So oftentimes if a student, not necessarily a special education student, but if there's a student that's struggling, they uh, are often sought after by our, our general ed teachers to give some input into uh, possible interventions before going to referral. They're PPT members. They attend PPT meetings every year for at least once for all of their students, sometimes more than once, depending on the student's needs. And they are data collectors. They work very hard to understand the student's strengths, weaknesses, and, and where to go from there. That helps them create those IEPs we talked about earlier. Oh, sorry. Could you explain where these special ed teachers are housed, where they go, what they have? For instance, my daughter, when she was in the high school, would go to the resource room sure. up here. Does sure. that, that but I'm out of touch with that. No, that exists. It exists. Sure, we call it something different. <coughs> um, what do you call it? Structured study. Um, but yes, it is a resource room. It's exactly that model. <coughs> There's a classroom where, teacher, where students will go to meet with a resource teacher. Oftentimes it's their case manager that understands, you know, that, that knows exactly what's going on in their, their program and then will begin to support uh, their IEP goals and objectives and implement those IEP goals and objectives. There are some students that will go into what's a self-contained class. 
So we don't have very many of them, but we do have a class called Transition Skills. And that gives them uh, support around uh, budgeting, banking, life after high school, um, how to cook, um, what it looks like to um, you know, get a budget together, what it looks like to do your own banking, what it looks like to live on your own, how much that costs, those kind of pieces. So there is a, a you know, um, interview skills, those kind of things about life after high school. So there is one self-contained class called transition skills. Is that a senior class? No, it could be. It's it's for the student that needs it in the t in the moment. Um, sometimes it could be. Um, right now, we've actually. It's it's really individualized. It can be any grade at this point. Um, and how do you integrate that resource time, or structured study time, in the schedule, the new schedule? How is it integrated? It's, it's just a class. It is like any other class? Yep. So they go into, they, they know that on period five, uh, they have structured study in Mr. Schroeder's room, and that's where they report. And he knows what their IP goals and objectives say. He's, had co he's collaborated with their teachers to know, if they're, you know, are they on target? Are they behind? Um, is there something that they're, a skill that, that needs to be addressed? Uh, and, and we go from there. And would you have, I'm sorry, um, would you have seven classes for the seven teachers, or how does this work? Two in the class, or how does that work? What's, I'm, I'm not sure of your question. Well, well, the middle high school has 7.5 teachers. Mm -hmm. So do you have like every Six. classes uh, for, for the middle and high school? No, everybody kids? on every, every special ed teacher, excluding two, co-teach. So, um, and each excluding two have structured studies. So you can teach. There's some teachers that are teaching, co-teaching three classes. So they're in their humanities classroom or they're in math and they're supporting the planning, they're supporting the grading, they're supporting the students and their needs and, and they're working with the curriculum with the general educators. So each of my teachers, excluding two, are working in classrooms. They also have um, structured studies. Oh, okay. And we've also implemented this year um, because, it, and that will go a little further down into my goals, uh, reading is still a real big focus. Mm -hmm. So we started um, this year working on uh, a reading strategies class at the Middle High, which wasn't here prior to that. They were working on reading during that resource time, but often found difficulty getting the reading done. And what do we look like in the elementary school with the four teachers? But as far as the breakdown, who's where? Yeah, I mean, um, how, two at how WPS. The services. There are two teachers at WPS: one at Booth and one at, at Burn. Uh, the and so they do similar things. They don't necessarily call it a resource room, but they do pull students out to get um, some pull-out services in the class. Let's say it's something that's not necessarily a grade level skill, mm -hmm. or let's say it's something that might take a little more focus and attention in a small group. Mm -hmm. So they do similar things to the high school, but they don't necessarily, kids don't know that, that they're going to a resource room. They just know that that's where they get their reading support or their math support. They are also in classrooms doing the same thing as the high school teachers are teaching. What do you call that in the no. elementary school? No, elementary school. It's co-teaching. Co-teaching, same thing. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, it's not like it, in a pool-out, it's not reset source no. room. It's just... Yeah, because they don't necessarily have a schedule like the high school students do or the middle school students. So that's just the, the time they go see Mrs. Hool or the time they go see Mrs. Uvalde. Okay. okay. Um, I, I ask these questions because it's not going to be covered later. I have no problem with asking as many questions as you want when she's done. Let her... <clears throat> I interrupted her myself, so go ahead. Uh, paraprofessionals, so important to our uh, program running. They're, they're the extension of the teacher out in the classrooms. They're, they're meeting service hours. All of our students aren't necessarily, all, all of our special needs students aren't in one reading class or in one math class. So we have our paraprofessionals, they are extensions of our, our special ed teachers and they work uh, in concert with our special ed teachers. They work in the classroom with small groups. They work in the, in the pull-out setting with small groups. They work with individuals. There are some paraprofessionals who are more or less assigned to one student um, based on the student's need. Um, they follow lesson plans that are shared by the teacher, both general ed and special ed, so they, both, they work in both environments. They oftentimes are behavior plan implementers. So if a student has a behavior plan, they might be tracking the behavior plan or helping the student track uh, what's going on in, in their plan. Again, uh, for everyone in the department, communication and collaboration is so key for, for them to be a part of that with everybody in the building and, and, um, and, and I guess not as much for the paraprofessionals outside of the building, but certainly inside the building. Uh, data collection. And actually several of our paraprofessionals have been trained as job coaches. We have several students out in the community at job sites in New Milford, in um, 
we've had them here in Washington, we've had students out at different jobs in Southbury, Watertown, and so we train six paraprofessionals to uh, accompany our, our special ed students out to those job sites and to track data, help students learn their job, track data back up and make sure we are, uh, students are having success. So paraprofessionals are a really important piece of our, our department. Uh, school psychologists, so they conduct evaluations. They are our uh, leaders in, in assessment. They provide counseling services. They're part of data teams. They're often the most important part of the data team because they really understand the data. They do. They have. Uh, they work with general education classrooms and support for that. Um, <coughs> several of our psychologists do, or at least at the elementary level, Ms. Burnham um, goes in and teaches second step to other, to other classes. Uh, they work with truancy and attendance issues. They are working on behavior planning issues. Again, collaborate and communicate. They deliver services as outlined in IEPs. They, they are at, at the head of crisis intervention. They consult with in, uh, outside providers as well as uh, in, in school providers. They're teaching classes. They're collecting data. They're PPT members. They will go to PPT meetings just as the special ed teachers do. And they work a great deal with our behavior planning. Speech and language pathologists, uh, again, conduct evaluations. They support speech and language in the general education class, and not just special needs students. So if a, if a little kindergartner seems to be having um, uh, some issues with uh, articulation, they go in and they do some, some work to um, assess and get a feel for if it's just something that's developmental, coming along. Uh, they're a member of data teams as well. Again, collaborate and communicate. Such an important piece in the department. They deliver services as well as outlined in IEPs. Uh, one wonderful thing that we're doing is several of our students who have social communication needs, we're out in the district, we're outside of the district, not just in district. We're trying to teach them to generalize their communication skills. So we're out uh, at different sites, going to the Washington Market to buy a few things and having them interact with the cashier, going out to Southbury uh, in two weeks to, to go to the Walmart and, and, and the McDonald's out there, trying to, you know, learn the, the complicated language, uh, you know, the, the social nuances of what goes on in, in, in our day to day functioning that it is challenging to, uh, to address in the school. So we, we do some work here and we bring it out to generalize it there. Uh, so our speech pathologists have really taken the lead on, on trying to move that forward. Uh, they consult with outside providers and, and in the school providers. PPT member and again data collection. Our guidance. Uh, they're case managers for students assigned in this building, so there's pretty much a, a dividing line. If your child has a, a last name in this area, you have these people. Uh, at the back end of the alphabet, you have someone else. Uh, so they, they take charge of someone's program. They do course planning. They're teaching classes. They're, they're de delivering services. They're on data teams. They're counseling. Uh, they do college support and guidance, which is a huge piece of their, uh, you know, huge piece of their time <coughs> now. Uh, data collection, transition services support. They help our um, special ed uh, teachers get those students out to other locations to have some work experiences, to have some job shadow experiences. They also work uh, with truancy and attendance. Our nurses, uh, medication management throughout the course uh, of the day, just the daily health needs of little ones that, and sometimes big ones that have uh, those needs. Crisis intervention. They consult. Uh, there's been many times I've needed to have some support from our nurses around um, something that I've learned at a, at a PPT meeting that I'm not quite sure on. They've been able to uh, work with outside providers to help me understand things better about <coughs> students' medical needs. Uh, they communicate with families, outside providers, staff. There's some new, there's some new uh, regulations, a state regulation around homebound instruction for students that are have medically verified reasons and so now they take a really big role in that they have to contact they have to um, work with physicians to determine whether or not that student requires homebound instruction and so there's a, there's a really big role um, in that that's new this year they work with the health policy updates they train our staff uh, EpiPens uh, those kind of things uh, they're PPT members and 504 team members um, for students who have needs uh, they support transition of students with medical needs. Um, we've, you know, we've, ha we've had students that have needed to go out to, to jobs um, that have specific medical needs, and our nurses are uh, integral to that. Uh, they track health requirements, our physicals, our pieces, or those kind of pieces. They do vision screenings, hearing screenings, and they create IHCPs, individualized health care plans for students that require it. They have life-threatening allergies if they have a medical condition that, that requires some specific planning, and they share that with our, with our staff. So they um, have a very important 
role in the district. Our OT and our PT are contract services. They're contracted services. Um, they're not part of our, um, you know, they're not the teachers that, that I, I hire or we hire here, but they are contracted services that we uh, offer to our students who require them. So occupational therapy is that fine motors, right? So it's your fingers, your little muscles, your hand, your, you know, handwriting, it's your buttoning, it's your zipping, it's, uh, it's that kind of work, that small muscle. Um, it's also sometimes visual perceptual. It's, it's being able to help them um, better place things to, uh, to better be able to do the work. It's sometimes sensory needs. Some students need some, uh, they have some sensory dysregulation. Things are more challenging for them, light noises, and they need something different um, throughout the course of the day. So the OT is a consultant in that, helps us set up programming for students who, who have those needs. Our physical therapist works with gross motors, so that those larger motor muscles, so the movement through the building, making sure that students can um, maneuver through the, through the, through the building and, and be as successful as other students um, uh, can be. Uh, both of them are members of our PPT teams, our 504 teams. They, they're consultants and collaborators. They collect data and they provide services. So our students in our department. Yes, Val. Jim, is it Sorry. okay? Yes, please. What's, uh, you've mentioned it three times now. I've been reluctant to ask. What is a 504? 504 is through the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and so it's a student that has a medical condition that, that um, <coughs> significantly impacts uh, a major life function. So it's it's sort of this broad umbrella. Special ed students fall under 504, but it's much more specific. Special education, you have to qualify for one of the 14 qualifiers. 504 is you, you have to have a medical disability uh, that impacts seriously impacts a major life function. So 504 covers every age. It's about accessibility. So it's it is physical versus uh, other issues. Not necessarily. It can it can be physical. Um, it could be mental. It could be a mental or physical impairment. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. So our students in our department, um, we have 135 students who are identified with special needs in this district. Um, right now, we have 10 students at private schools that are placed by parents. So what that means is we have four <laughs> private schools in this in our borders, and no matter where those students come from, whether they're from Region 12 or they're from Region 6, or they're from Woodbury, or they're from Bethlehem. Those 10 students at those private schools become our students because they're in our borders. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little later on, but I have 10 students uh, between the Montessori, Gunnery, and Rumsey. There are seven students placed um, by our district <coughs> at private special education facilities. Three students are at 18 to 21 year old facilities, um, uh, one of the two, all three are on college campuses. Um, while they finish their academic requirements, they've not finished their transition requirements. And so, because they haven't met their transition goals, the district continues to be responsible for them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about a transition, uh, an 18 to 21 year old program later. Uh, we have, go ahead, sorry. Um, are these students counted in our census? The 18 to 21? Okay, so when we see a total number of students in our uh, in our school at Bishop Hogg, it includes the 18 to 21, yes. and it, it includes... It's usually in 12th grade. I would assume it's 12th grade because they're considered super seniors. Right. Right. So that's, I, I will check, but that's where I think they are, if they're seniors. But even the ones that are not physically here but require services they, still would be considered part of the number in our census. You mean, what do you mean when you say census? The number October? Yes. 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 October one yes. yes. Okay. The, the ten private schools? No. No. Not not the not the ten private schools. The the, the ones that we place out that are our students. Th Seven. Those are counted. Seven. The ten private schools. We we count those for the state. The state wants to know who those are. The parentally placed students. But they're, while while they're part of my 135, <coughs> they're not counted into our numbers in the district. Right. However many we have, they're not. Counted. How do we account for those? Because they take resources. I can talk to you about that in a little bit. Okay. That's different right. than the Board of Ed budget. Okay. Okay. Um, so there are three students at approved special education private programs that we've placed there. Uh, and there's one student at a public school that's been placed by the district there. Um, one of our students is at Nottawak on choice, student choice. And I just wanted to mention that on our caseload, 
there are three students from Sherman and one student from Region 15. Okay. What do you so mean that's by part one, of our 135. One student choice. What does that mean? Well, there was a cho the student still is part of our district. We are the nexus for her, but she's in Region 14 right now at Nottawa. So she's still considered mine, although um, the program, she's not here. Her program is provided better at Nottawa specifically, or she she chose to, to go there. She wanted. To, she's part of the VOAG program. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm sorry. Special Ed VOAG student. Yes. Okay. So the distribution within the district. So of the remaining kids that are in the district, we have 32 students at our elementary schools, and we have 85 students up at the middle high. What? Sorry, once again. Uh, so your total 135 does not include the 10 private schools, even though we are servicing them. It does. It does. It does. So My 135 does. Okay. Thank you. Yep. We were saying the census for the school does not include that. Yeah. Right. I just yep. wanted you to know how many IEPs we have actively running. Okay. So about the students that are in the private schools. Okay, they're considered privately placed, uh, private, uh, privately, parentally placed private school students. So if your student, uh, if you're from Morris and you want your child to go to Washington Montessori and your child already has an IEP, an individualized education program, they've, they've been determined special ed, um, and they go to Montessori, Montessori informs me, I have a meeting, they become one of our students, okay? They don't have to live in Roxbury, Bridgewater, or Washington to be on, on our rolls. Um, so there are four schools there that we can, um, we can be responsible for students there. Um, child find obligations, so, oh, I'm sorry. That's all right, I just, but then I don't understand why the student we're sending in analog is still our responsibility, not theirs. This is, these are private schools, not walks at another public. So it only, it only works with private schools. Right, so there are some towns that have no private schools, so they don't have to worry about this. Um, okay, so we have four, so we have to worry about this. Um, yes? And the Sherman students that come to our, our high school pay tuition. If they need services, they are becoming, they are our jurisdiction. No. Or Shermans. They're Shermans. Sh Sherman um, is still responsible for their program. We implement the program. So Sherman comes to the meeting. The director from Sherman, Susan Ackman, will come. Um, we'll, we'll both be there. And she'll, uh, our team will tell her what we see and what we think the student needs, and she'll authorize that or not. And it's part of their tuition then? Uh, yes. So they would pay for those services through additional tuition? I'm not sure about the Sherman tuition as far as uh, I guess uh, I would have to ask Bob. Hmm. I would assume it's included in the regular tuition. Pardon me? I would assume that the Sherman Special Ed students' special ed. needs are met within a regular tuition. That's too right. right. It's part of that calculation of tuition. No matter what their need is? <clears throat> Unless they have a one on one, if some, <clears throat> if you have Allison that identifies it with a highly specialized one on one situation. <clears throat> then they have to pay for those kind of services, but the general services is included in it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so I talked a little bit about a student that, let's say, was from Morris that came to one of these schools and already had an IEP. Um, so we're automatically responsible for that. We get a phone call, we go over, we review it, we talk to the team, we find out what they need, and we proceed. There's also a child find obligation that we have, just like we have here in district, to identify students locate, identify, and evaluate students that we think have a special need, we have to do the same in those buildings. So um, we've worked really hard with Montessori, Rumsey, and the Gunnery to explain the state process, you know, the processes that are set up within the state and, and um, how to proceed with pre-referral kind of work that they should do with students before calling us. And, and then we, we have PPTs and we meet to discuss the kind of things that they've done and then we decide to, you know, whether or not we'll evaluate. And um, that includes our psychologists, sometimes our speech pathologists, sometimes our OTs, our PTs. Um, and <coughs> the, the .5 special ed teacher here at the Middle High, she's also my .4 uh, teacher at those three buildings. So she, um, so she would do the assessing. Yes? Ellen, do the private schools have any um, special education program in them themselves, or are we providing everything that, that those students would need? Devereaux Glen Home School is an approved private special ed program. Right. 
um, and, and uh, so they do their own programming and we haven't had any um, uh, information about students there that uh, are parentally placed that fall to us. Um, but the other buildings, they have like, they have tutorial services that parents will pay extra for. Um, you know, uh, language support uh, services. That, they call them a little bit different in each of their buildings. At Rumsey, I think they call it language support. At um, <coughs> Montessori, they have two tutors that, um, and they also have an OT at Montessori that does a little bit of work, and a speech pathologist that, that uh, they contract with. So there is, um, but again, those are additional costs to, to, the, to each family. Yeah. I'm sorry, John. Let, let, let's let her finish, please. Please hold your cool. All of our questions. Um, so, Just so you know, not only are we responsible for servicing students there, we're responsible for find, finding them. Uh, so we do many initial evaluations each year. I would say we're somewhere in between the privates, anywhere from 10 to 15 initial evaluations uh, each year. Uh, we also need to service the students. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what the services look like next. Um, but at each year, we have an annual review for them, a PPT meeting, and we plan out their services for the next year. Now, the services plan uh, is not from our Board of Ed budget. It's from a, a 611 grant, the IDEA grant. Uh, we're required to put a portion of our IDEA grant uh, aside to address the needs of the students in the private schools in our district. Um, so it's a clear, it's, it's clear funding, I, I, you know, there's a specific formula. I take the number of students that are at the private schools, I divide it by our complete number of students, including them, I take it out to the fifth decimal point, I multiply it by our amount, and I get the amount, or the amount of our grant, and I, that's the amount I get for the private schools. Um, so the funding really only allows for some services to happen for students. And when the funding go is gone, the services are done. Um, I've tried in the past two years to not have funding end in the middle of the year. Uh, we've been thoughtful about what kind, of fun, uh, what kind of services we can give to students. So in doing that, I've, 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 um, we've hired the .4 teacher uh, that allows for continued service throughout the course of the year. And there is a little bit of um, funding also allowed for some speech and language support uh, from a contracted provider in those programs. So each district can decide what they want to do with their grant funding. Uh, and we at this district have decided that we will fund a special ed teacher for a portion of the day. So she goes out um, four mornings a week. And she's between the buildings, she's divvies up her time based on how many students we have in those locations. So four mornings a week, she is in the private schools supporting students based on um, what their goals and objectives are. So, and they, the students don't necessarily receive what they would receive if they were in the district because we just don't have that kind of funding. So that, that grant funding makes it very clear what we can and can't give. Um, and, it, and it makes conversations pretty clear about this is what we have, I can't do any more than that. Um, but that's what the district has decided to do, to provide a teacher and some speech services. Okay, so when we last spoke in February of 2012, I shared with you some of the department goals that I had, and I just wanted to give you some feedback on where we are. Um, the first one was to increase time with non-disabled peers for all students. Uh, I was surprised when I got here to see that it was a bit lower than I would have expected. Um, the next goal was to improve, and it's always a goal, to improve CMT and CAP performance of students with special needs. Um, we wanted to improve the accuracy and timeline, the timeliness of our IEP paperwork. We wanted to improve our compliance with state um, timelines and directives. We wanted to improve student independence. And we wanted to identify areas of over-identification and monitor progress. So, the current progress. Um, our time, time with non-disabled peers in 2012 was listed as 62.02% uh, of the time students were with their typical peers, 80% or more of the time. So 62% of our students, special ed, were with their peers 80% of the time or more. Uh, 2013, I wanted it to be closer to 75%. That's the sort of my expectation to be in the 70 to 75% when I, when I came. Um, so we, we've made a really thoughtful effort to try to uh, increase time with peers if we can. Understanding that we can't always, but uh, we've begun to make that movement towards the 70s. I'd like it to be higher, and that's something we're still <coughs> continuing to work on. Um, but our 2013 data has us at 68.25. So 68% of our, our students are with their peers 80% or more of the time. 
uh, our CMT and our CAPS data, um, CMT, our proficiency at the, at the elementary our profici and, and the middle, our proficiency rates are really strong. I'd like to see our goal rates a little higher, but our proficiency rates are very strong. Um, to me, reading is still the main focus from that data that I've, I've looked at. Um, the CAPS, science and math, are weaker than our reading and writing. Um, it changes because it's a different group of students each year, but that, that's the data that I've gotten from this, this year's work, is that our science and math are definitely weaker than our reading and writing. Our timelines and accuracies, uh, it's definitely improved. Uh, I've, I've put in a, a finalization process, so each time we have a, a PPT meeting, we're supposed to get out our documents to the parents within five school days. Um, in order to do that, I've met, uh, each teacher knows after the PPT, we set up a time frame that I'm gonna check in with them and I'm gonna ask them for when things are complete. And then I review the, the IEP. Last year we started with me sitting with them and reviewing the whole IEP to make sure it was ready to go. Right now we're down to the, the point where they'll just say, it's ready to go, Allie, send it off. And I'll go through, I'll check it, finalize it, and send it out to the parents. So that's the way that I'm making sure that within five school days our paperwork is out uh, as, as the state requires it to be. Um, as far as meeting state timelines, when I, when I got here, the, the first piece of data that I was a little surprised about is that uh, our evaluation timeline. So the state requires uh, each district when they are initially evaluating students, when there's a student that we're trying to find <laughs> eligible or not eligible for special education, um, there's a time frame. You have to do it within 45 school days. When I, when I came, the data was 76% of the time we were doing that on time, uh, which, which is something we needed to work on. So we, we made a real concerted effort to, at, at each meeting to, to pay attention to uh, what dates when, when things were due, we talked to each other, we made sure that we were um, meeting those, those timelines. That's just, it's an absolute requirement. The state considers you either meeting it at 100% or not at all, even if you're at 96%. So we've gotta meet those, those deadlines. <coughs> student independence. So the things we're doing. We're increasing our student participation with peers in the general population. We're, 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 we're increasing our work opportunities. We have students out. Uh, at the cookhouse, out at uh, Watertown Convalarium. We have students um, going out to the Milford Hospital to work. Uh, we have students who have uh, been at the vet in Watertown as well. We've been at Southbury at the Walgreens. We've been um, all over. Uh, we're, at, we're actually in Danbury right now at GE. We have a student working at Sodexo, the food services. So we've really uh, <laughs> explo exploded our, our students and having work opportunities. Um, giving students opportunities to participate in community settings, uh, field trips, um, monthly field trips, particularly for students who need that opportunity to, uh, to improve social skills. So we're having mo um, monthly field trips, sometimes to specific sites um, to uh, practice a skill, sometimes for a social opportunity um, to be able to socialize with peers um, in a fun activity. So we're working a great deal there with uh, increasing their independence. Things that should be making a difference this year is that special educator, educators are working with general educators in curriculum development, scope and sequence. I got to sit in on, on that with Lori Ferreira and the humanities team and, and my special education teacher. So this, with, with, her, with all of their participation and their heads working together to see how our students fit into the curriculum, that should certainly increase student independence as well. And then just the participation on the PLCs, looking at data together with the general educators, looking at, um, you know, how they're assessing, looking at what they know, um, that should certainly contribute to student independence. Uh, exploring the areas of over-identification, continue, we continue to be on the high end of the spectrum. Uh, when, you, when you look at the state average, it's about 11.6% of the population to 12% of your population is uh, identified. Our district right now is about 15.6. So we've been as high as 16.3. We seem to be 15.3 if I figured out my numbers, but this is last year's data. Um, still an area that needs continued work. In, in my assessment, we don't seem to be, I think the data when we come to meetings seems to be um, indicative of students needing support if they are found eligible. I think where we might need to work a little bit is when students um, have been eligible but are really improving and have sort of closed the gap. I think it's hard um, sometimes for people to understand that they've closed the gap and maybe they're no longer eligible and they no longer require something specialized. I think that's a scary thing for people, so I think that that's an area of, of focus, a continued area of focus for our department. I would encourage you to do that. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, 
those were sort of a review of where we were uh, the last time we talked, uh, moving forward. Um, it's nice that we don't have to worry about any of the timeline things anymore, any of the paperwork things anymore. What I really want to concentrate on is creating better IPs, uh, making sure that our alignment between students' strengths and weaknesses and the services we're giving them and the goals we're creating for them is really closely aligned, that they make sense. Uh, things that we've put in place to help teachers do that is we've created our own IEP rubric, things that will help teachers when they're working on their, their IEPs to know, you know what, what is best practice, what should be in there. Um, it's also going to help because we're working um, on getting together as a group and do peer review of each other's IEPs. We want to make sure that somebody who doesn't have that student could look at an IEP and determine this is a strength, this is a weakness, yeah, that goal makes sense. Oh, no, that services, those services make sense. So teachers are beginning to work together in that way to um, improve their work. Uh, stronger collaboration with general education, general ed educators. I think these PLCs have really opened up some, some conversations that um, need to happen. Uh, there's co-teaching going on. Um, there's support within the mainstream classroom that, that's going on. And, and these PLCs, and this opportunity to work and develop curriculum also, uh, to have special educators a part of that, uh, is, is a great way to um, strengthen our work. Um, I, I'd like to strengthen our department procedures and create some guiding documents. Uh, I want to make sure that things that are happening here, or things that I want to happen here for a particular incident, will happen the same way at Booth and Burnham and Washington. So we're, we're working on that as a department. Uh, a reading focus. I mean, it's so important that students are reading and reading well. So uh, we created that, middle, that reading strategies class at the middle high school here. Um, and the elementary push right now is to really try to close the gap so that when they're in fifth grade, they're, you know, we've, we've made up as, as much as the students needed to make. So a lot of my elementary teachers are creating their, uh, around their teacher evaluations, they're creating their student learning objectives out for reading to make sure that we're, we're, we're really pushing reading. Um, but we still need to look at that identification process and why our numbers are higher. That's still, that, that's still something on the table. One of the things that we're working on um, is that transition program for our 18 to 21 year olds. There are students that are not ready um, to leave school and be considered college or career ready. And so that could mean one more year. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to stay until 21. But um, we do need to offer something for our students that are not, have not met their goals, their transition goals. So this year I made one of our special ed teachers, uh, I, I, she's become a bit of our transition specialist. So she's learning the roles along with the work from a consultant on how we can best meet students' needs. How do you contact a company? H how do you see if they would be happy to have our students come in? How do you, how do you work that through? How do, you, um, how do you assess how a student's doing there? How often do we do checks? How do you manage that? Um, so we have one of our teachers here at the high school that some of her work is related to transition alone and making sure our students, um, even as low as eighth grade, some of our students in eighth grade are getting work experiences in the school. Um, some of our students, you know, at ninth grade, tenth grade, they're out, they're out at sites two times a week. Um, there are some students that are out four times a week, five times a week, um, depending on their program and what, what's required for them. So uh, we're really honing in on that. That's a very important piece of a student's program. And you know, one of the pieces is I have three students out at, a, uh, at, a, at other districts. One in, in uh, Western Connecticut uh, State University has a program called Western Connections. And UConn Torrington has a program called Highlander Academy. And uh, they're not run by the universities. They're run by public school districts for students from 18 to 21 who still have IEPs. Um, but you know, there's a cost to that program. And so, you know, just explore what is our potential to do something here internally. We offer wonderful, in, wonderfully individualized job experiences. If someone wants to learn about, you know, we had somebody go to um, a hypnotherapist to learn uh, about what, what was the schooling and, and what did that look like, or we've had kids go out to the convalarium. I mean, sometimes at, at these programs, when you have many students, you, you end up going to a store or retail I think we, we do very individualized um, job settings. So I think that potentially in the district, we can do something internally, um, but that'll take a little bit of work. But that's where I'm moving. Any questions? Well, thank you very much. That was a great report, especially the current progress, the progress made, so that's very good news. Any questions, Greg? 
Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, two things. One observation. Uh, it really sounds like you've made tremendous strides toward expanding the horizons and opportunities for, for our students. I want to thank you for your, your hard efforts. Uh, and the other question I have was, you mentioned the interaction with nurses. And I'm assuming these are not nurses specifically assigned to you. There are nurses. There so are nurses. They're just part of our. There, there, and can you have any any general estimate or idea on what percentage of the nurses' time is involved in um, dealing with uh, some, nurses. some nurses here? Special ed students. Oh, special ed students. Well, your program. Anything under your the aegis of your program. Um. We did have a need. Um, to, to, uh, that Mrs. Devello was helping me to support a student who needed um, some support once off campus at a job site. Um, you know, I don't know how much of the time would be considered dedicated special ed alone. Of each day. Hi, uh, ladies. Why don't you introduce yourselves? <laughs> yeah. Some of the, some of you. Hi, welcome. Did you know you were talking tonight? <laughs> <laughs> um, just to introduce hi, yourself. I'm please. Lisa McQueen. I'm the nurse at Burnham School in Bridgewater. Thank nice you. Welcome. Well. Um, hi, I'm <laughs> Sandy DeBella, and I'm the nurse at Booth, and I'm also the nurse coordinator. Thank you. So I'm not really sure what amount of time is dedicated to special ed alone. I mean, they certainly participate in PPTs, um, P meetings for our special needs students. If if it's part if it's part of their the students program, they certainly are part of our 504 meetings. So there's time taken, a uh, part of um, of their day for that. Uh, but those aren't happening every day. If, at the time. I'm not sure we have anybody in district right now. Special ed time, that you're, the nursing time that you're spent with maybe special ed students. I don't know that it's... Well, it varies. It varies, yeah. Students. And was the question also regarding students that are out on activities and other programs? Well, do you have to hire nurses for it? No, I, I, I was a little bit, you know, I, I suppose that, that's, that's a concern too, because I know that occurs and you do have that situation. I just wondered if there was a you know any any measurable thing I and mean, whether it was different for elementary versus the middle high school or what. Okay. I don't think there's any sort of major special ed okay. education need that Thank has you. a nursing need yeah. right any now. Other questions? Right now. Right now. Okay. We've certainly had it. We've certainly had them, but not right now. Okay. Right. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so we have 134 35. students. 35 students identified with needs, and about 124 are within the district. 125. 125. Okay. Right. That would be considered still ours. Right. Um, if I'm counting correctly, we have 37 dedicated special education staff members. Is that ratio of 37 to 125 about average in the state, or it seems like we have a lot of special ed uh, professionals working with? Uh, our small population. Well, um, I don't. I think the the way we are located, we have three different elementary buildings. So I, I couldn't see a way of not having a special ed teacher in each of those buildings. So I mean, if we were all in one place, would potentially I have less um, special ed teachers? Yes, at the elementary level, right? Um, the the paraprofessionals. It really varies year to year and kid to kid. Right now I have at the elementary, the reason I have so many paras at the elementary, when you look at the, the grand scheme of things with the numbers between the paras at the, at the high school and the, the elementary, I have little ones who have needs that are such that there is a para assigned to four students. We have one para is assigned to one, and I have four of those. So we have little, little students who have significant needs who need a para to support their program. Um, so. Um, I feel lucky that I have that because I'm not sure how I would support the other kids, students' needs if I couldn't um, give those students a one-to-one paraprofessional. Um, I think numbers-wise, if I could condense at the elementary potentially, but I'm in three different buildings and I can't. That's, that's my next question. What, what do you think the percentage of headcount reduction would be, assuming we consolidate elementary in one building? What would be the percentage overall, going from 37 to what would you estimate? I, I don't, I'd have to look, especially it's not that simple that you can just look at the numbers. You have to look at the students and where they'll be. So if I have students moving from the elementary to the middle, then I potentially could, could, could decrease the teachers more than I, than I could if they're staying at the elementary school. But it what, really can is, you give me a, a kind of a number? Well, I would guess that if I could get everybody in one building, how many mm -hmm. did I say I had at the elementary? 30, where's our students? I have 32. 
So I would say instead of four, I could have three if I was all in one, if I was in one building. Teachers for elementary. Mm -hmm. For for the high school in the moment, I don't think that that is an unheard of number of support staff members to work with that number of students re with what we are required to do, especially to, when my paras go out to job sites, they're not here helping. They're at job sites helping. So I lose some flexibility internally. I have 85 students that at any given time are all over this building. We don't put all of our <coughs> students in one spot. So because they're spread out, I have um, a co-teacher teaching one of the humanities sections, not all of the humanities sections. So if there's another humanities section going on, and I have a few students in there, I have to send Paris. So I don't feel like we're tremendously overstaffed here. I actually feel a pinch here. So you feel that we're in line with the norms of other school districts like I've us? I've not checked other school districts. And if so we were to consolidate, you think we'd reduce headcount by maybe one? To, if that's my, without even looking, that would be a guess. Okay. But, I mean, if you would think that you had 32, then if they each had 10, <laughs> a 12, that would be reasonable, as opposed to four. But right now, the way we're set up, I couldn't not give um, Burnham a special ed teacher or Booth a special ed teacher um, based on the needs of the students in the moment. Perhaps at some point, could I say, you know what, a, a half-time special ed teacher can go to Burnham only because their number is smaller, or a, a half-time special ed teacher can go to Booth, that's only if the needs of the students allow for that. So there are some students that need support or they need uh, access to that person because of behavioral needs or, 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 or social challenges or, or behavioral challenges. So it's really hard to know. I, I think it's, it's tricky to know unless I look at each kid individually or each group and say, okay, I think that this, could, uh, this group could be, uh, this, one, this, this high need student is going to the middle school next year, so I probably wouldn't need a full-time teacher there. I could use a part-time. I think it really is dependent upon kids. Anything else? Valerie? Um, a couple of <coughs> definition problems, I guess I just challenged. Uh, uh, PLC participation means? The professional learning communities that Pat talked about. The high oh, school has their okay. professional learning communities now, and my teachers are a part of them for in their departments that they co-teach. And SLOs? That's a student learning um, outcome, the objectives that they're setting for the teacher evaluations. So the teachers are setting two um, objectives this year. To, uh, for their, to, be, you know, to be evaluated. And so a lot of my teachers, because we've had these conversations about the need for increased reading uh, or improved reading, are setting their SLOs around reading achievement. And they're trying to make up more than you know, a year and a half to two years growth in a year. So there's a real focus there. Okay. And then I just wanted to, um, another quick question. Um, the school psychologist, um, is the psychologist available for parents directly or do they only work through the school with uh, evaluations, data team, general education support? In other words, if there was a real crisis, how would a parent or family be able to use their services or can they? Sure, so something's going on for a student that's not necessarily identified? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think a parent would touch base with the principal and the principal would line up the psychologist to, to talk to the family and to see what they can do. Great. Yeah, we absolutely do that. Excellent. Uh, and then uh, my question is the child find obligation. That's six months on? No. What is, what is our obligation by law? Three to 21. Age three? Yep. But don't we have to go out and, and give some kind of information to parents of younger children? Then younger than three? Yeah. No. That's birth to three. Although we've had parents call before and say, you know, my one and a half year old seems to have an issue, and we can refer them to birth to three services. Once the student is about two years, nine months, birth to three won't do anything anymore, and then we could step in. Okay. So where would those par those parents wouldn't get services from us? They go to a state agency. The, this younger than three. Right. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, what service? Uh, say, child find obligation is three to twenty one. Um, what services would we give to, say, a three-year-old who is not in, you know, lives in our area but is not necessarily participating in our program? We would offer them services in our program if they were found eligible. And how would we do that? How would we? I offer mean, them services? Uh, do we give services to the ha to the well, family first directly? Have, you know, we'd have to do a screening. Yeah. So we have parents that call. I have yeah. I had a parent that called that says I, I said I have um, a three and a half year old. I'm worried about this issue. 
Um, so I, I take an address, I take a phone number, I take an age of the child, I send out an address, I send out a developmental history so we can get some background. Mm -hmm. um, my, uh, one of my preschool teachers calls, sets up an opportunity to meet the child and screen them. Mm -hmm. um, the screening is just a sort of an initial assessment tool. From the screening though, the teacher knows whether or not we need to meet. Um, sometimes it's just developmental and parents don't know. Um, sometimes it's something bigger. So if the, if the special ed teacher does the screening and says, you know, um, we need to do something more. We come to PPT, which is a planning and placement team meeting. Um, I, I attend those. Um, we set up, uh, if we feel like we need to do something, we uh, conduct an initial evaluation. At that age level, it's a developmental um, screening. So we'll do something like a Battelle, mm -hmm. um, the assessment, and um, our full team will do it. So oftentimes, our speech pathologist will do the communication section of Battelle. Our OT and our PT will do the fine motor and the gross motor section. Mm -hmm. um, and our, and our um, teacher will do the academic and the, the attention piece. We evaluate if we find that the student needs, uh, is eligible for services. Um, then we identify them with a developmental delay and we offer them a program in our district based on what the, the testing tells us. If it says that, that they need speech, we offer them speech. If it says that they need um, OT and PT along with the speech, we offer them a program in district. There are people that choose not to come um, and we just know we have them on our radar for when the student comes to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I was a little confused because I know that we have two nursery schools in town, child care facilities, one, and a nursery school, and that I know in the past when there was an identified, and I, I, my concern is this early childhood because once you get going on services there, chances are that these kids can actually catch up Absolutely. to their peers. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, originally with the REACH program as it had been, these kids would be able to go to their, their little nursery school or daycare and then get services at REACH. Is that still the case? No, and I've not known it to be that way here when I've been here. And so this is the start of my third year, so no. Um, the, but they can I get mean, it could they could, could they come to us first and then go to to their other program? I guess if they wanted to come into our program, do our program in the morning, and then go to another program, they could. If they if they chose to do the nine to twelve and then they go to another program after twelve, they could. Okay. Um, the other way around would be a challenge mm -hmm. because uh, our program runs nine to twelve or nine to two. So if, for someone to come at one o'clock or twelve thirty. Um, wouldn't wouldn't make sense. But they still can avail themselves of the services if identified as a PBT. Yes. Yeah. And I, I mean, I guess in theory, uh, if someone only needed speech, and they came at, and we had a speech pathologist that was able to support them mm -hmm. after 12:30, we might be able to do that if a parent were to bring them there. Um, but not not very easily. Okay. Yes. Go. Cool. Um, just a question, when you were talking about, I think this applies mostly to the high school, but possibly the middle school, um, that you have, let's say, one teacher for humanities, let's say, who is providing services for students um, who are special education students in their regular ed classroom as well. Do you, when you're looking at um, the scheduling them, and they're a special education student, do you automatically slot them for that teen taught class, or do you try to spread them out to maximize contact with non-special education peers? Right, um, it really depends on the student. So at our PPTs, at our annual PPTs, uh, I listen and I get a sense of what the students need and, and our, I make sure our service plan, our, our service page is very specific so that I know that when there was scheduling done this summer, um, that if somebody needed to have a second teacher in the room, we were sure to put them there. We want to be really thoughtful about not overpopulating our classrooms with students with special needs. We right. like to keep it, uh, I would say, under 30% of the classroom. I mean, that would be what the state would expect, nothing more than, than that. So students that just perhaps need some paraprofessional support to perhaps stay focused and on target or to have a, a review of something, then we're, we're able to put them in, in those classes. So it's, um, we're, we're thoughtful about not overpopulating classrooms and we're thoughtful about giving students what they need. So um, there are, you know, there are two uh, language arts classes, I want to say at the same grade level, that have a co-teacher because there was that kind of a need. 
Um, so we sort of adjust and put people where they need to, to go based on the student need. Um, but if you, you know, if we couldn't put every student into those co-talk classrooms, they would just be too special ed heavy. So there are certain students that need it, and there are certain students that would do okay with some other type of support in the classroom, and so that's how we make that determination. Um, the um, areas of over identification that's is, is that sometimes a misnomer? Is it just a matter of our, I mean, I, I this could just be conjecture, but that we just happen to have a greater population <coughs> of, of students in need, or that we're perhaps, we do this so well that people move here just for us, and that's why it's a little higher, or have you found that there really is any cause to believe that there actually could be, for some reason, an over fastidious identification? Um, I, I don't know that people are moving here for it, um, I think more like what I see is is that I don't see us when, when I go to PPTs because I do every single one of them in the district I, I don't feel like we're making students eligible without data I feel like it's the, it's a real it's a real deficit it's a real disability I feel like there's not that I think uh, so moving forward I hope that as our numbers Students graduate, students are coming in that are eligible. I, I think our numbers will go down. I think there are times that perhaps students were made eligible that, that um, as they progress, they're not needing the type of services anymore. And I think it's, hard, it's a hard conversation to have. Mm. Your student that has special needs in second grade and now they're a 10th grader, what do you mean? So I think that that's us having our data firm and it's students getting the support they need if they're not special ed. So let's say they transition out because they really don't need anything specialized anymore. That's really what special education is. It's not a separate education, right? It's something specialized to get them to catch up. We don't want them to be here forever. Um, kids tend to be. So um, because it's, you get there and you sort of stay there. Our hope is that you give them what specialized work they need, you catch them up and they, and they move on and they do well. Part of that is making sure that people understand that there are supports for your student once you leave special ed, they'll still get what they need. And I think we have to build that up. So in other words, this isn't necessarily, your continued work is not necessarily problem solving, but more just maintaining diligence in, in your... Uh, right, okay. and being thoughtful. I mean, I, one of the complications in identification here in the district is those private schools. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know what they're doing as, uh, in their work. Um, they come and they tell me what they're doing, but it's really hard to understand exactly their program in compar comparison to our program. So it's hard to know. It's not really apples to apples. So that's, that is the one complicating factor here to, to, to identification, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And we've worked really hard, and they're, they're very willing to work with us. I, I've spent time at the Montessori reviewing state procedures and you know, state requirements, and I've spent time at Rumsey talking to people as well. So they're very willing to work with us. We just have a very different system than they do. I just wanted to ask you, that difficult conversation you were having about uh, talking about having transitioning out of special education status, is that a conversation that you have determined over your time that that was avoided in the past? Oh, I, yeah, it's <laughs> hard, know, hard to know. say. I just think it's, I know when I'm sitting in meetings, it's a hard conversation okay. because I think what they worry about, and sometimes teachers worry about it, so it's, it's not as... Okay. Right. Probably an unfair question you want to hear. Anyone else? I do have one other question. For example, guidance counselors, you were talking about all their roles, case manager for assignment. Has it always, not always, but I mean, has it always been that way or is this something that you've devised? No, you know, roles? there's an awful lot of overlap between our guidance counselors and our psychologists. Um, so it's not that they're case managers for everyone. So, and it's not that they're giving counseling service to everyone, but there are times that kids are better connected to a, one of the guidance counselors as opposed to our psychologist, or better connected to our psychologist. So they share that work. But that's been done in the past? Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. And just one other thing, on the special educator on page one, the paraprofessionals, those numbers, those are not equivalent, mm -hmm. are they, to FTEs? Yes. They are? Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are, right. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, committees, reports, communications. No, no, no. Uh, we haven't met. We'll uh, probably meet uh, first in uh, January, February. Okay.
education. Um, no, we'll be having a meeting shortly, and I've gotten a couple of suggestions of things to add to our agenda, and have um, forwarded those to Teresa, and we'll be making sure we include them. Right. I'm going to skip the education connection because I don't have a chair, so I know nobody's been there. Facilities. Yes, uh, we have made great progress. We have completed a list of, uh, of we're going to suggest the repairs to the middle high school as part of that long range planning process. Uh, what my plan is is to share that with everyone as soon as we can get it in final form and get it out. My goal is to have it to you seven or more days in advance of the meeting on the 18th. So you'll have an opportunity to look at it and we are going to invite everyone, I'd like to invite, extend an invitation to everyone to attend the Facilities Committee meeting at 5 o'clock p.m. on the 18th here. If you have specific questions that you would like to have answered, I'm also going to encourage everyone to ask their questions by email that they may have on this so that we can get them answered prior to the meeting, preferably by email, so that we don't have to have a lot of questions at the meeting and you can get a more, deter you know, more detailed answer prior to the meeting. So the goal is to have plenty of time to look at it so that when we come to the next meeting, you can be in a position to make a decision uh, on, on moving that aspect of the long range plan forward. So that's the game plan, and I look forward to either seeing or not seeing you on the, on the meeting. Maybe all your questions will be answered uh, by then. But I would encourage people to ask your questions by email so that I can pass them on to the right people so they can get answered in a more systematic way. So all right. Is that it? That's it. That's it. Right, thank that's you. Any questions? Finance, we already anything? We had a meeting, short but sweet meeting, just before this one, and a couple of things. As usual, we went through the financial report um, for the district ending October 30th, 2013, in which we are still, of course, in the black, 10.3% of the budget, 2.2 million. Uh, no real questions um, in any of that review. Uh, quickly, uh, the final results of the health audit, that is to say the, um, of the uh, independent audit on our uh, health plan by Sterling Benefits, in which they check to see who is still on our plan, who, who is qualified, who shouldn't be. Um, basically, that has been completed. The cost was 4300 but there are about $16,000 in claims that could be saved, so we are netting in the positive. Because of that, a little less than $12,000, uh, just in identifying people now who should or should not be in our health plan. And the more specific and, and salient thing is this goes forward. So we're paying it forward, so that going forward, we will be reducing our health costs, hopefully, because we have identified some of those people, about five dependents, that are not qualified. And then, a quick conversation with tuition revenue for Sherman. Um, we have income accounts as well as, of course, the budget, which is expenses. And we have a difference of about $38,000 in projected income because our projected budget students for Sherman decreased by three. So instead of 21 Sherman students here, we have 18. That was what we thought we would get. That's not, act those three didn't just come and leave. Um, so we have a deficit of about $38,000 of what we had hoped to be tuition income. However, Bob has indicated that we have two other kids now paying tuition unrelated to Sherman, uh, about 16,000 each tuitioned in here. So some of that deficit in revenue will be offset. The further question, I think, is just a review of the fact that we have, we do charge um, $8,700 a year plus the to Sherman, plus the expense of the bus. So $8,700, and we absorb the cost of the bus for Sherman. And we only have 18 kids. Um, and the conversation was also, <laughs> The tuition for the non-Sherman students is about $16,000 a year. Substantial income. I would like to have this board sometime or another have a good conversation about tuition. Because I think we need to encourage people to come here. 
$16,000 a year, you might as well go to Montessori. Um, and we have a great facility here. So I think even though it's town revenue that we're talking about, not school district revenue, we absorb the cost. Mm -hmm. I think it's worthwhile to talk about how we can set um, tuition across the board that's far more attractive. And that was it for finance, and that last part was me. Thank you. Trust, do you know you make another one? I did. We'll put it on in December. Yes. All right. Some point. Any questions for Bill? Thank you, Don. Reads and call vision report, Dr. Costino. No, we're good. Negotiations, Greg? Yes, we have commenced uh, negotiations with the teachers union. They're ongoing. Meeting again this week. All right. Policy, Michelle? Um, yes, we have several policies on our agenda tonight, um, and the, the policy committee has been working hard on the audit and uh, the policies that we need to put in place, um, but we've, we've come up against a couple snags with some numbering with CAVE and some inconsistencies trying to sort out things, so, so uh, we're going to get that sorted out and come back to it, but it's been a little difficult, uh, some of the numbering. Are, they, are these the policies that are on the agenda for tonight that you want to take? Uh, those should be solid. The okay. ones that we're, we had questions about were compelled and they will be coming forward um, soon. What we're finding too is that some of the policies, <coughs> I'm going to just say, for example, smoking is going to be coming up shortly. We needed to add a policy uh, about grounds, no, no smoking in the facilities. We realized that it was cross-referencing <coughs> several other policies. They were not consistent, so we're probably going to bring them all together at once to keep the, the topic okay. together. So, so we're working through some of some of that, but um, we will continue to bring policies forward. Thank you. Any questions? Long way to find three, goal three. Yeah, I just um, want to let everyone know that the building committee has met, and um, we are. Uh, close to recommending one of the architects, uh, Don is doing some research on their fee proposal to make sure everything has been included so that um, hopefully by um, the next meeting we will um, be able to present an option to you. So 7.4 is going to be put on hold tonight. And then the project manager, um, that is all due to us on Wednesday. So hopefully on November 18th, we will have uh, a couple of different things to propose to you. So we're looking forward to that. Any questions or comments? Yeah, we have a lot of uh, things in place, the architects um, and other plans for the time that the referendum passes on school consolidation and the change in the plan, the regional plan. What kind of a fallback plan do we have um, in place for should the vote be no and the plan is not amended and I would propose that we formulate such plans and <coughs> pursue them as actively as we are the plans for a yes vote because it could be either so I understand it could be either if the plan to is voted down the board will have to reconsider what it wants to do with anything but why are we doing a great deal of careful advanced planning Anticipating to yes vote, but not a no vote. My understanding of the idea is to present as much information, good information, as possible to let the people make an informed vote, either up or down. So, so they all have the information the you're talking about will be done prior to the, the Yes, that's the what we discussed, yes. Present some, as good information as we can to allow people to make an educated vote. Do you think it might be a, a prudent idea to pursue some kind of a plan B and actively pursue it and with a subcommittee of this board or something, should there be a no vote? I, I don't speak for the board, but it seems uh, anti, let's get this one done. If it's down, if it gets voted down, we'll decide what to do. The board will decide to do what to do. Uh, if, as I said, if anything, Greg. There's only one group that I know of in the world that pursues two mutually inconsistent theories at the same time, and that is lawyers arguing alternative reasons for things. And we do it, and we're uncomfortable because it confuses juries, it confuses judges, and confuses sometimes the lawyers themselves and their opponents. 
you really, it's very difficult to pursue two mutually inconsistent things at the same time. If the board is going to pursue this, we'll pursue this. If we are not successful, we'll pursue something else or nothing. But it would be very confusing for the public for us to be pursuing consolidation of the school into one school and the, and the building out of some improvements to the middle high school, while at the same time, uh, just for example, uh, if, if we decided to pursue um, building a K-12 school as an alternative, or if we decided to pursue tuitioning out the students as an alternative, or we decided to pursue a dissolution of the, of the region as an alternative, you, you pick anything. Anything you pick and you put up against it is going to be two mutually con inconsistent things and you cannot pursue both at the same time and expect the public will be anything other than are you guys you need to have your heads examined. Right. So that's my concern about it. They'll think we're crazy. Right. Kelly, just for, to answer, I have not thought of that. I mean, I have not planned that. I have not laid that out until you just brought it up tonight. Susan. You know, perhaps to Kelly's point, it, it, it has more to do with when we do enter into sort of a public forum discussing the pending referendum and people are um, wanting to to know the, the what ifs, we do need to have a cohesive, almost a united front, the, the, the what ifs, right? I mean, what do you say? What do you say? What would be the possibilities? I mean, we can't just pull it out of, of our I just, I just want to say, I think the vote whatever it is, is going to give the board information. And I think until you have that vote, you don't have that information. You don't know how many people, if it's a close vote, if it's a 100% are voting no. So I think you need that information and then you move forward. So I agree with Greg. I mean, we have to move forward. Um, this is um, an important vote. You've never voted before to get this information. Once you have the information, if it goes down, then you take the next step. But right now, I think we have to be united um, front and move forward. No. Um, th this makes sense because you really wouldn't want to, it makes sense not to plan for two things at once. Um, I, I, I guess what I'm, I'm concerned about is that project manager and the uh, architects, these are all going to cost money before the referendum. And some money, yes. Some money. And I, I mean, the big elephant in the room is that this referendum will not succeed because Bridgewater <coughs> will vote it down. Thank you for letting us know that. So now that you've been told that, spending money on the hope that it will succeed is wasting the taxpayers' money. Are you asking us to not have the vote? I'm suggesting now, you know, something that, it's just knowing as, as, as the bills are piling up, something that Pete Tagley asked for a month ago, two months ago, that I didn't think was a good idea because of just what, what, what Pat just said now. We've never had this vote before, so we don't know. Well, we had the vote before. We had this vote six years ago, and, and we've ignored that vote for as long as possible. You have a vote six years ago. All right, all right. We you have. Alan, you, you, you keep hold on. Out, Alan. We had a vote. We had a vote. Do you want to consolidate, or do you want to renovate the three schools? And the, the, the do you no, want? No, you never had that vote. That what vote was never March? put to a public referendum. What happened on March 7th? Please, please March stop. March 25th. Alan, do you have something that you, if you want to finish it? The, the, yeah. the board has right. voted to proceed this way. This is the way we're proceeding. Right, but here's the thing. There was a question for a little moment of whether we should proceed to find out this answer without going to the expense of adding the number. And the reason I suggested that wasn't a good idea was just for this very reason, is that some of our members don't even remember that we had this vote once before because we didn't have a number attached. And I felt that this time, in order to make it stick, maybe, we needed to have a number <laughs> attached. But the problem is, getting that number attached is only costing the taxpayers more money. We need to find a way to have this referendum to find out this answer to this question, which, for some reason, needs to be re-asked every seven years without it costing as much money as possible. 
So I've changed my mind, frankly, period, I admit it. What Pete suggested in September, September, yeah, all, exactly two months ago. And in itself, I don't think was sufficient that the questions that we were talking about that we had in front of us as a motion for to go to referendum was sufficient because we need to make sure that it is binding. Now, if we have language in it that is binding, that we have language in it that makes sure that it's also not in any way compromising ourselves if for some reason it does pass, that we, the, the point that um, Michelle Gore brought up, which is we don't want to be stuck with a decision that makes us beholden to build a new school, yet then have subsequent referenda that fail on how much to pay for that, and then we live for however long uh, in violation of our own referendum that suggested we needed to build a school. If, uh, let me make that a little clearer. We have a referendum, do you want to build a school or not? It passes, yes we do. There's no number attached because we wanted to save money to get to that question. Then we have subsequent referendums saying, okay, we're gonna build a new school, how about for this much money, that fails, how about for this much money, that fails, how much for this, and it keeps failing, and then all of a sudden years go by and we don't have this new school that we now have made a change to our uh, regional plan that's demanding. So that's something we need to solve. We need to solve it on one side to make sure it's binding so we don't keep asking this question over and over and over again. And we also, on the other side, to make sure that it allows for a subsequent uh, uh, price point and a bonding referendum if it does succeed. But waiting and, and, and spending more money on a referendum that I, I don't know, I don't know how, cl how clear to be about this. I have, because of my other political aspirations, talked to hundreds of people, hundreds. You know how people say hundreds a lot? Hundreds, literally, people in Bridgewater. <coughs> and about I have four families personally I've talked to are four closing burning. I know of about five or six others that I haven't spoken to personally. We're talking nine or 10 families. Now let's say I'm totally wrong. Let's say it's five times that. That's 50 households in, in Bridgewater that are excited about the idea of consolidating. There are 300, 1,330 voters in Bridgewater. It's not going to pass. Why are we spending taxpayers' money? Because some of us on this board want it to pass, and some of us realize it will not. And that's what I want to change now. As opposed to worrying about project plans and architects, I think it's time that we figure out how to, how to do what Pete wanted and get this done, but also do what I want and what Michelle wants, which is to make sure that it doesn't put us in a perilous position by having a referendum question that doesn't have a number. I think we, we, we've got to figure out a way to, have to, to do it without a number. Um, mm -hmm. But we have to make sure we don't get ourselves in trouble doing that. I can't. Can you All right, Jennifer? Well, I just want to say that obviously it has to pass in all three towns for it to fly or not fly. So although I know that it's clearly not going to fly because Bridgewater's not going to pass it. However, there are two other towns that very well may still want the information because even the Bridgewater may not want it. And I don't know whether or not Washington is going to want it or not. I, I can't say that. I'll only know when the votes come in. However, if hypothetically speaking, Washington and Roxbury pass it, there are still two towns that may want that information. So even though Bridgewater is not wanting it, should we just dismiss what the other two towns may want and the information that may want to be presented to them? I mean, in all fairness, there are three towns, regardless of whether or not all three towns vote yes or no, there are three towns and three opinions, and all three count. So information is being presented, and sometimes you have to spend the money, just like the real estate information. People in Bridgewater wanted it, and then all of a sudden they didn't. But you know what? I'd rather spend the money and just say, we did it. So that way, it's off the table. So sometimes you need to spend the money to present information, even though everybody knew. I also think, going on what Jen says, which I completely agree with, that that will answer your next step question. This referendum is going to answer the next step question. Because if two towns overwhelmingly pass it and one does it, that's going to very clearly delineate the future. So, valuable information. Let's get to it. That's what we're trying to get there. Yeah. Michael. You know, I, I do think that um, Kelly's suggestion is, is a good one in the sense that, 
you know, I agree that as a board, we've taken a vote and we're moving forward and publicly, um, it would be very confusing if we were publicly talking about different ideas. However, there are many levels that we could start looking at other options, particularly options that we as a board feel that we have a lot of consensus and agreement for. I haven't heard a lot of people on the board disagreeing that we do need to spend more time and attention on facilities, for example, at Chapog, with the exception of whether we, if we close the building. Then. That's something that we know we have consensus on. We know that we have public support for. So why we should say, let's just not talk about that because we've got this other priority, I think would be a mistake. Uh, I think we need to think about that. It doesn't need to be publicly and in a public forum at this point. It could be at the level of the administration, the administration thinking about what we could do if that scenario of it, if it going down happens. I just don't want us to be, spending, you know, spinning our wheels for another year because we lost time. I think that we, if we could be on the ground running, if it does go down in a forum, I'd like us to, to have that plan B that we could move fairly quickly on. Well, as part of this referendum, we're developing information with regard to the needs of this building. And I'm not saying that that information wouldn't be valuable. All I'm saying is that I think that it would be intelligent for us to look at other priorities that we need to address besides a consolidated elementary school. Not right now. The, the vote that's been planned is a vote not only for a consolidated elementary school, but also for monies to for work on this building. Telephone. Um, we have a two-part vote coming up in our referendum, which I hope will take place in the spring and before school is out of session. And um, we could we could propose any number of enhancements to our facilities. We could put a ski slope in, a Olympic size swimming pool, but it's not germane to the core question, which is, do the people that we represent want to change the regional plan? Do they want to amend the regional plan and in the direction that we have proposed it? The, the superintendent and the board have proposed to put on the table a consolidated um, pre-K through through six school or through five school. If they vote no on amending the plan, it doesn't matter what other facility enhancements we have uh, done studies on or proposed. If they vote no to amend the plan, we are back to square one where we were a couple of years ago. And I have said to Gary, our board attorney, that if <coughs> the vote isn't respected, we will probably end up not just in the state Supreme Court, but in the Supreme Court of the United States because this is a voter rights issue. <coughs> and other school districts will be looking to see what happens here. It's I'm, a very I'm critical issue. You. Well, I expect that the vote, any vote that's taken will be respected. I don't expect well, an appeal I'm, on a vote. Okay, there's some well, impropriety. I can see any number of legal recourses or um, a visit to the state for recourse. Perhaps, but I, for what? Yeah. I don't know, but but my point is that I would rather we take a leadership position and not let either the disgruntled citizens take the lead or it get to a very litigious it's, point. It's the Board of Education's responsibility. Well, then let's be responsible and let's have a plan that we take as seriously as the one we we're taking to build a consolidated school and put all those uh, I, dots over the I's and the bars over the T's. And let's have a plan for the day after the referendum, should it be a no vote to amend our regional plan. Because right now we don't have anything in place for that. But we're getting quite a lot of detail and money spent on the other side. If I can remind the board, we passed a motion that we should all be behind as board members. And that was June 17th. I have it here in the minutes, it's easily accessible that we are going to put forward to the communities um, a plan to change our regionaliza regionalizational plan and this proposed amendment to the regionalization plan to be contained in this report shall be Region 12 Long Range Planning Committee's Option B, which includes the construction of a new pre-K to grade 5 building, etc., etc. We voted on it. It's law. 
We have to get behind it. That's what we've been told, that that's our responsibility. Once there's a past motion, we uphold it. We work towards that. This is what we're going to do. By the way, in reference to 2B, that would indicate dollar signs to me, because that is part of our reference in that motion, which we passed. Could you read that so again? can we just, I read, could read the whole damn thing. read the whole thing. Is that Motion made by Laird Davis and seconded, seconded by Valerie Anderson. The Region 12 Board of Education shall prepare a report on a proposal to amend the Region 12 Regionalization Plan as approved by the State Board of Education dated August 16, 1967, including the question to be presented to be filed with the Commissioner of Education in accordance with Section 10-47C of the Connecticut General Statutes. This proposed amendment to the regionalization plan to be contained in this report shall be Region 12 Long Range Planning Committee Option 2B, which includes the construction of a new pre-K to grade 5 building on the Chicago campus at 159 South Street, Washington, Connecticut, along with renovations to the existing Chicago Middle High School and the discontinued use of the Burnham School in Bridgewater, the Booth Free School in Roxbury, and the Washington Primary School in Washington. Uh, vote yes, Tony Bedini, Laird Davis, Michelle Gora, Jim Hirschfield, Valerie Anderson, no. Michael Sinatra, Emily Hibbard, abstain. Susan Stumpf, Franny Keiko, Greg Cava, Alan Brown, the motion passed. So this is our law. This is what we uphold as a group, end of story. And by the way, seven years ago, we had a small bump in enrollment in, um, in Booth a decline in Bridgewater, and a, a decline but not steady decline in Washington Primary School in terms of population. Now the writing is on the wall. We are going down, and we're going down big time. So seven years ago, six years ago, five years ago, is totally different from what we're facing now, and which has been reconfirmed again and again in our demographic study. But long story short, the Board of Ed supports the motion. Okay, we move on. Michelle? Hold on. Michelle. I just wanted to add that um, I was going to point out the demographic piece because I think it, um, it would be silly to say we would never reevaluate the situation we're in and so to look at our current demographics and not propose something would, would be foolish. So um, those change, so we have to change or, or change <coughs> with it. The other thing I wanted to point out about the finance the financial piece of this vote is that I think that is important for some people as to how they will vote. They need to know the implication of amending the regionalization plan and they may make that decision based on whether it is a financially good one and we can't really answer that for them without good numbers. So I think it is money that we have to spend to make sure that we are putting forward numbers that are solid so that our voters can make an educated decision. Okay, Alan? Um, I'm, the reason I asked Valerie to read the whole motion is because there are no numbers and there is no indication of any requirement for number in the motion that the 12 of us are standing behind. So we can very easily follow that motion that we uh, adopted despite some of us abstaining or voting against it because numbers were removed from that. And I, as I said, upheld that once, but now I feel that it is beginning to become a greater and greater waste of taxpayer money, and that there is nothing in that motion that precludes us from being able to put a referendum out there that follows that motion that doesn't have these numbers, which are going to cost, well, we'll find out on the 18th if we're gonna keep, keep up with this, a lot more money. We've had this discussion now, the board has had this discussion, and the board has decided to proceed with numbers. So that's, and, I, and I must say that I find it to be presumptuous of you to speak for the entire town of Bridgewater and that you would deny your own citizens their right to vote. That they so, vote. Hold on. That they would, that, that, that's what you just told us. It will fail, and that may be true. I don't necessarily doubt that, but that each person is certainly taxpayer in Bridgewater is entitled to vote, to go into a voting booth and vote their conscience as they see fit. And so, um, I think we yeah. should proceed to lice. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, I'll give you the last but, but Jim, uh, to be fair, oh, your assumption 
and the superintendent's <laughs> assumption is that you are moving forward with these cost analysis and with the planning. The board has believe, decided. I but, haven't. But you believe it'll it'll pass. So no, I didn't say that. I've never said that. Well, then why would we? I'm hoping it would. Of course, I have. We get some decision. I want a decision. I want a decision, an educated decision by everyone. Then give us some direction. And then the next day we can all sit around in a workshop and develop some really other alternatives, if any exist and if needed. You never know, Bridgewater. All right. I would just, I just want to answer Kelly's question. There is no corporation in the world that ever has to undertake a project which involves a substantial uh, realignment of its physical plan and the commitment of resources to the future improvement of its physical plan to set the tone for the corporation in the future that does not expend seed money in order to figure out what it, whether or not it's appropriate. Uh, you talk about a waste of taxpayer money. It would be a gross waste of taxpayer money not to explore what the options are going forward because the one thing we do know if we do not do anything and we vote this down, and this is what I would tell the people who want to know what happens if we vote it down, we will spend more money than this referendum anticipates spending. We will surely spend more money going forward to maintain the current collection of three schools and to do to this building what needs to be done to it. So the question is not whether, the question is not whether we have no options. The question is if we do nothing, we will be spending more taxpayer money. So it's a gross waste of taxpayer money not to right. examine these options at the present time. But otherwise, it's going to cost us more. It really doesn't. Susan. That's fear mongering. And that's borderline no, irresponsible. Right, what, 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 the, the question, the, the if this doesn't pass, then what? Needs to be thoughtfully answered mm -hmm. with a strategic approach. The board will meet and yes. we will follow this, whatever. Whatever you just said what, would, is absolute fear mongering uncalled for and, and intimidation of a vote. And we can't proceed like that. That's not, well, that's, that's not we all have answer. It's not my opinion. It's the bloody long range but, planning uh, process. Right, what did it say? No. The cost of the what status quo was what I am calling for, Greg, I have the floor. Plans. What I am calling for <laughs> is a, 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 a script, a what if. If it doesn't pass, then what? People would need to know that we as a board would act quickly. I talked about this before. We would need to turn it around and act quickly. I wouldn't do anything. And then and respond how and do what? It, you know, it, we don't need to uh, belabor the point of, of the cost of maintaining all, all the schools, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It would be. Someone wants that uh, people want something different. How do we begin to address that option to be is not what the majority in the three towns want? I think that's what the, the, the question originally was. I have a straightforward question. If the amendment to our regional plan is voted down, what are your intentions as the head of the board and what are your intentions as a superintendent? Will you seek redress at the state level or will, do you expect to pursue any litigation on the matter? Or will it stand? If it votes no, will that vote be respected and will it stand? You know, I want to speak to that. I mean, I, I have... I've received that question from a number of people. I have no present intention or information that if, if it was just a regular vote and it was voted down in some way, the amendment of the regionalization that there would be any further action to take to go into the state or anything like that. That would have been the vote. That was the answer. And then we would convene a meeting and decide how we might want to proceed from there. Um, so I have no, you know, no other plans on that. I, I would not expect that I would claim that there was some impropriety in the vote. I have no reason to believe that. And this, uh, no, assuming there's not. And the superintendent, again, I just. I, at this point, um, and following the board's motion and decision to move forward. That's what I'm doing. If it fails and, you know, the boards of education, you fall under CAVE, the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education, and they have a voice with the legislature. So if you feel that you want to take it another step as a board, you can do that. You can get involved with CAVE 
and you can talk to them about possible legislative uh, initiatives of changing laws and doing that kind of stuff. Me personally, I am a very concrete, sequential person. We have a plan. We're moving forward with it. She's got a job. And, what, uh, and you know, and this is just one, like maybe 25th of everything that's on my plate. So I am trying very hard to do what everybody needs to be done, to do it in a way that we're following procedures. Uh, we have many, many meetings with Don and Bob and the attorney to make sure we're doing everything possible. Um, you know, the project manager will be a person who can lead us and help us to but this my, referendum. my question was on the legislative relief. And if the vote is no. And so you did, you are saying the board could then formulate a proposal. The board can always go. You have, um, you know, every right. I might introduce a motion. To, to, to make a, a, a recommendation to the board about the, you know, you're not in the same, you're not in the same, you're not alone in this problem. The whole northwest corner and the northeast corner of Connecticut are having the same issues you're having. It's just that you're a little bit of ahead of the game than other people. Um, Colebrook and Norwalk, Norfolk. Norfolk, Norfolk, excuse me, are also just right behind you. Um, everyone is dealing with this issue of the rising costs, the declining enrollment, the aging facilities, and trying best to meet it. Um, I just feel right now, uh, whatever the taxpayers say, I think, you know, they are the taxpayers. We have to listen to them. But I think it's really important to get that information and hear what they have to say. But my, my question was, will we respect their vote or will we seek to I, I, res it? I try to respect everyone. I don't have the power to not respect what the taxpayers say. I work for the pleasure of the board. That's my job. I do what you tell me to do. You're, before I got here, you're the ones that told me about goal three. You're the ones that started the whole situation. And I think that's important. I think something that gets lost in the wash here is that you never go back to the strategic plan and the reasons you put this forth. There were 31 people on that committee from Bridgewater, from Washington, from Roxbury, and from the board, teachers, administrators, who said, this is a problem, okay? The three elementary schools, the cost, the, the um, repetition of services, this is a problem, and you addressed it. And you asked me to follow through, and I did that. So I'm just, you know, we start, you started this ball rolling without me. I'm just trying to help you to get where you need to go. And I think we can be very, we are very cautious about getting off track. And that, that you, know, you know, that worries me because I think we have to be a board and I'm looking at your core values, number one, which say, deliberate in many voices, which you did, We're but then govern in one. And you know, you made a decision, we have a motion, it passed, we're moving forward. You need to govern in one, get that information, and then with that information, then you deliberate again in many voices, you make another decision, and you govern in one. And that's how I see it. But I'm not, you know, I'm not on anybody's side. I'm just trying to, you know, facilitate the, the uh, program. All right. Is there anything else? What's going on in the place? Yeah. No. no. There's a real estate report here. Oh. I'm sorry, Michelle. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, I was just going to ask if we could possibly start the new business and then go back to old business because we have staff waiting. Yeah, we don't even have to do real estate report tonight. All I want to say is it's here. If you want, I'll put it on the next agenda if there are any questions about it. We could just put just it after it. if just everyone's okay. No, it, it's fine. Okay. I don't have a problem with that. Sorry. Fine. And All I should right. probably not said anything. You should have. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, All right, so we'll go on to new business. Kelly, I'm, I'm sorry. Michelle. All right, so if you look in your packets, we have um, – uh, several policies, and we're going to start with 5141.221A, student uh, as a student policy, particular. I'm saying that right. Mm -hmm. So the proposed policy is on the front. The current policy is stapled to it. It's very small. This policy was developed by our nurses and is in compliance with all of the. Um, uh, regulations that, that they work with and I I would actually like to ask them, since they've waited for so long ask them to speak to any questions they might have uh, 
Just, just formally, can, can I move that we, we um, accept this for a first reading? Second. All right, move the second. Yes. Can, can I ask you a question, Michelle, about yes. this policy? Um, is, the, is the chief difference, uh, I, I read them both, but you know, I, I have this, I, I, I will read this again. I really think we need to have policies underlined. I don't care what it takes. We have to have four people doing it so we can see what the differences are. But I take it the chief difference is we're abandoning the no knit policy and going to a, a policy that the health authorities have determined is more appropriate, the nurses have determined is more appropriate. Um, yeah, I will let the nurses speak to that. I just wanted to point out for the for the lining, we usually do that, and you'll see that on one of the other policies. Yeah. This one was so, much so different, and the, the and the current one was so short that I really felt that we could actually just read the, read the two without all of the strikeouts because they were so radically different. Um, but I, I would like to ask. Do you ladies have anything to say? If you'd like to speak to, add, to this policy. You understand the way the policy works is the board has to approve it at two readings. Approves it tonight for a first reading, then it comes up to another meeting and approves it for a second reading. Once it's then it's policy of the board. So we're looking at it as a first reading tonight. You feel it's okay. okay. Is there anything else? I'd like to all those in favor of approving. Is there anything else? No questions. No to the questions. That we asked to be here? Well, I mean, I have a question. I mean, did, was our procedure lacking? That we needed to codify it more. I'm sure they were doing their job. They were oh, I, I know they were doing their job, but <laughs> but I'm just curious. Policy or not? Well, we wanted the policy to be a little bit more defining because it's a highly charged topic, <coughs> and we just thought we would have strength in having it written out exactly what we would do, and based on you know the National Association of School Nurses and the American Academy of Pediatrics, and we just thought it would be stronger for right. and, and I appreciate the supportive confidential and non-judgmental manner I think that's important all those in favor of approving 5141.221 a for first reading say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed mm -hmm. All right, passes. Next, Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for being here and all your work on this. I know the last time we had a, a policy related in the health field, there was like an hour of conversation tearing each other to shreds. So, so not tonight. We wanted referees that? here. We didn't need them. Got it out of the way early. Thank you for your time. Thank you. But lucky they went second. All right. Our uh, next policy on the agenda, 6171.2, Preschool uh, Special Education. This was one of the policies that was identified in our audit um, as lacking in our policy manual. It was not, however, lacking in procedure. We were following everything um, here. Al, Al and the, her department were are following the law. It just was not reflected um, in this particular policy in our manual. Has Ali seen this? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Move to accept as a first uh, reading. Thank you. Second. Mm -hmm. All right, moving second. Any other discussion? I think it's good that we're getting this tonight because we had a very good and thorough presentation, mm -hmm. which I really, really enjoyed. Because um, some of us who have had services given to children or not needed to understand all of what we're doing. I'm also reassured to see that some issues with Judea Nursery School have come up that some children or some parents think that they're not going to get services if the child's identified if you're in a private nursery school setting, but you are, as long as you live in Region 12. All right, so 6171.2, preschool, preschool special education. All those in favor of approving it for the first reading, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? All right, it passes. And lastly. <laughs> All right, so next in your packet is the student nutrition and physical activity student wellness policy 6142.101a and this one um, is the proposed changes are lined through thank you so yes yeah, so you can see what the old policy was um, this went to our health committee and um, was overseen by um, our new is it physical education department? Jason. Is it 
Jason. Yeah, Jason, but what's his, what's his title? Natalie. No, no, no. Oh, Jason Conway. Conway. He's the uh, coordinator of physical education and <coughs> health. Physical and health. Okay. So he's, he, and he's also head of the um, committee on this, uh, but they did a lot of work on this last year. And these were their proposed um, changes. The, the large, the, the, one of the big things, and, and this should sound familiar to us as the board, you, if you look at number two, uh, it's the food program and the sale of, of food sales outside of the, we, we, we every year decide not to participate, Bob brings that to us. And our policy did not reflect that because it had been written before when the government had made the changes to the wellness requirements. So, so that was sort of the substantial change in policy and, and practice. And then a lot of the other deletions um, are more on, on how the, the policy is administered. It's just they made it a little less onerous for the committee to um, put in place, and Jason will, will be the one overseeing a lot of this, and he felt that this was good language and uh, worked for him. So basically, there's a lot of procedure in this that doesn't need to be in here because this is policy, not procedure. And that's mm -hmm. a lot of the strikeouts you see on the third page. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, is there a motion to approve this? Second. Second. To accept it? Is that a first reading? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'll so move. Second moves. Any second? I'll second. Any further <coughs> discussion? I'm approving 6142.101A for a first reading. Sorry, is there anything else? Yeah, I, I'm just going to ask a question. I, I, I assume some of these things that are crossed out, that the intention here is not so much uh, to, uh, to remove them as to have a more comprehensive plan developed through in a little bit more general fashion as opposed to very highly specific things. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea that a healthy school environment should not be dependent on revenue from high fat, low nutrient <laughs> foods to support the school program, the fact that we've crossed that out does not mean that we're planning on going on a fat raising, fundraising binge here. Uh, it, it means that we've got a different way of, of attacking the problem. Exactly. And, and, and specific things like the federal guide pyramid, now they use my plate. It's, right. it just, it's less specific, but the intention is still student wellness. Student stuff. Hmm? And stuff. Student and staff wellness. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. Excellent. All those in favor of improving 6142.101A, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. All right. If we can go back to item six, old business, the real estate report. I believe it was in your packets. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. You learn a lot. Okay. We keep it all stuff. Anybody want to comment or it's just here for you know you got it? Um, Pat, did you have anything? There? No, I, th I think it was. Um, it was a uh, comprehensive report based on what uh, she had said to us. Uh, you know, it talks about that you really can't make. You know, on page two, the results of the study are not representative of the subject situation. That was the information in, um, uh, where's that one, Vermont. Okay, and then the main also. Um, there, there are too few valid sales in any one town to draw any conclusions in any of ours. So it really just said, because of the small number of households, there was not enough significant sales data which to draw any conclusions. And that's kind of what he says as he goes along. But um, this well, was a requested report. And what, it, we're in a, a unique situation where you asked this man to look to see if he could find others. He couldn't. That's what it's at. Yes. And to, uh, no. So have we learned anything from this? No. No, that's good. Okay, so. Uh, yes, we learned that it was looked into and that we could not get any information. Right. Not yeah. that we ignored it. It's okay, due and, diligence. And so right. what, by not finding any information, what do we learn about something when there is no information available? But you can't draw any conclusions. That's what you learn. <laughs> How about we actually learn something that some of us here are very resistant to learning, apparently, that no one does this. It has not been done. In one state here, it says, Maine, finally we turned our attention to Maine to locate a comparable study area. 
Maine has town tuitioning and a flurry of recent consolidations following a law mandating school district consolidations in 2007. Which law has recently been reversed? So only under a law does this happen, and then they even reverse the law. Do you think we might actually do some research as to why they reverse the law, what they've learned about this? We're not Ooh, talking about why the they reverse the law. Cool. So the point is, is that oh. nobody, um, no, nobody closes their elementary school. This is what we can take from this. That's not what that says. We know the data is because there is no comparable data. That means there are no elementary schools that have been closed in a comparable situation to ours. They just said, if you read the next sentence, it says yeah. there are 53 towns in Maine without elementary schools. Right, right. So that, that what they're saying is that the data is inconclusive. No, it says most of these towns are rural with significantly lower incomes and housing prices relative to Washington, Bridgewater, and Roxbury. Which made them not a good comparison. Right, right, not a good comparison. In other words, there are no towns that have like the us. incomes and housing prices relative to ours who do this. Mm -hmm. In other words, we all we couch all of this in terms of cost, 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 cost. Mm -hmm. Clearly, only towns with significantly lower incomes and housing prices are reach the point where they can't afford this. Although, and it is an act of desperation, clearly, to close your elementary school. Uh, we are not no, at no, that no, point. No, no, no. Okay. That's, no, it's that's not at that point. That's Most of these towns yeah, with significantly lower incomes and housing prices relative to Washington, Bridgewater, and Roxbury, they are significantly lower. They cannot afford it. The only thing I get from this is the fact that Bridgewater, on average, makes more money and has the cheapest houses. That's the only thing I pull out of this. Done and done. Greg? You know, there's another conclusion that you could, that you could really draw from this data, and, and, and that is that, that it was postulated that the closing of an elementary school in a town will have a tendency to have a negative impact on the property values of that town. Uh, this study finds no such correlation. Uh, not only that, but the second thing, the conclusion you can draw from it is, is because we have a unique situation here, it's very possible that we could actually live with almost anything that we do. We might be able to live with one elementary school for three towns because we have a uniquely committed and, and financially acute bunch of people. Look, if the concern is, is that the town is going to crater if the school closes, shouldn't we be a little bit, as a board of education, a bit more concerned with what the effect on the children is going to be? That they're forced to go to school in tiny schools, forced to go to school in tiny schools? Okay, since educators. you over, so okay, you're not talking over me a lot tonight, I'll talk that to you. Our, you that hour, that knowledge, all the talking. Stop. That, Both of you, stop. That our educators have told us are risking the educational. All right, great. Uh, all right, Greg. This is educational well because children. you will have to remember that the, that school that you're talking about, which is so unfortunate, is also the top of the district and one of the top of the dirt. So. Thank you it's for irrelevant. saying things. All right. it's okay, irrelevant. that's enough, guys. Maybe it's irrelevant. to you it is, but to you, not to the people who okay. live there. Not to the people who live there. Oh, come on, get a life. You know, right. get a life. You, you, Greg, stop. Greg, stop, please. Just stop. If he's going to launch into this ad hominem concept that well, somebody has great scores, anything. all right. I'm saying is, is that, you know, fine. Point Take your great scores in your school and find, take it somewhere else. Okay, you got please. people that are concerned about their kids in these towns from the opposite side. You're concerned about your property value. Greg, Some people please. are concerned about the kids. Greg. Motion to it. Oh, that's what I'm called for. Really, it is. I wish you, if you're not, if you're going to ignore the chair, then you know that's the way you'll have your meetings. Susan, I'm going to reflect back on some of the feedback that we got from. Uh, we need to people who have left. We're not yes, deciding anything. Right no, no, no. The, 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 the feedback, the, oh, the, okay. the surveys, right? Oh. We're losing people from this town, right? We're losing uh, people who want to find other jobs because of the instability. That was the common theme that we heard in those surveys. You know, there's instability here. We're not sure if the school is going to be here. We need to find uh, jobs elsewhere. You have heard the feedback, you know, people are not moving to Bridgewater or maybe considering moving out, not just Bridgewater, but, but the three towns in this region because of the instability of the school system. So it's, it's, it's very reasonable to be concerned if there is no longer an elementary school that people will move out or not move in. 
and mm -hmm. th therefore property values and uh, so much else will be affected. It's it's uh, connecting the dots, and and th you know they've already been laid out earlier this meeting uh, from the smattering of, of feedback that we've gotten. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Jim. Um, but also, I've noticed from the feedback from the staff that they also were asked what we should do, and a lot of them said that we should be consolidating. So for me, when I speak to a lot of these teachers off the record prior to be being on the board, <coughs> every teacher that I've said that they feel educationally the best thing to do is for these three schools to come together. And for me, that holds a lot of value, more so than an opinion about what keeps a town thriving. It's important to see what keeps the students thriving. I all respect right, thank what you the all. teachers say, uh, but uh, if they don't live here and they don't pay the taxes, then they do. may not necessarily pay. Uh, they may not pay attention to. You know, Hershey, I think the I'm trying. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm moving on to item eight. Opportunity for the public to comment on agenda items. Well, are we here? doing or or dare we do seven point four? We're putting yep. that no, on. Right. What about seven point five? Also hold. That's on. Okay. Hold. Table. No one here, so we don't have an executive session. Is there not motion to adjourn? So moved. All those